and we're recording. Yay! Here we are. So, uh, what I wanted to do is do, uh, and I think Chacha was my discussion with you where you said something really uh, important. You know, what's the, sometimes the information is hard to grasp, um, and how do I use it? Like, how, how can it be practical? So, this weekend with Krotolo, uh, on the presentation, um, he touched on how this knowledge that we're learning is practical. And also I went online um, to the Daminer University website and I listened to the gentleman who wrote the book, Coyote Cardo. It's in Italian, seven, eight minutes presentation. Um, but, uh, and I'm gonna summarize it for you guys and, connect, and connect it with what Crotolo said. Um, so that in this chapter we just finished of time, we're going to see how it applies to give a, a picture of what we are living today with this pandemic and the intensity and what's at play. So I think this will show you why this information, how this information can be applied to every day to make sense of the world and possibly take the edge off because we have a bigger landscape of, you know, what is at play. So I'm gonna start with, when I listened to Coyote's presentation, he talked about the fact that right now we are um, in, um, we, we just finished the time packet. Remember the time packets are these uh, um, events, this, 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 all, all these uh, events that are happening, they're held nice and tight in this 66 year time packet. And what's happened is we were in a time packet that got cut short um, because there was this divine attention. And remember each time packet has divine attention that started and that closed it. And these are the times when divinity sort of blink. And in that blinking, what is happening during that time that they're blinking, that separates the time packet, is much more potent, it's much richer, and what happens tends, has a longer impact on the events of time moving forward. So they're much more potent. So what happened, he said, is the uh, time packet was cut short. In 2017, the divine force opened its eye uh, and it's going to last till uh, 2022. So we are a little bit more than halfway through. And during this time, uh, the stream of uh, time is much richer. So it goes faster. It's that river of time. So when you're close to synchronic lines, there's many more opportunity for synchronic events, for complexity to be developed because it's more intense. So guess what? Since 2017, till 2022 we are going to be uh, under the watch of uh, under the opening of the divine attention coloring all of this uh, moment and then the time packet that starts afterwards will be um, colored by what's happening now and when you talk about time travel it's much easier to have an intervention in the time packets when there's divine attention because the events have more weight i don't believe i what i read in the book it's that it cannot be changed so what's happening right now gets sort of imprinted and then you know you can it's harder to come in and do uh, something here probably because it's five years it's very intense and and there's not that many unsaturated events to come in pick up and do something with. So I wanted to give you that. So what we're living is right on cue with, with that. And then there was another element that is interesting that uh, Kayori talked about, uh, and then I'll mention one that Krautolo talked about. We have not touched it yet, uh, but it is in the end of the book. So I'm not gonna give too much detail. I'm gonna give you my experience with this topic. And it's the topic of the grail. Uh, so Coyote mentioned this as well because it's relevant right now in what we are experiencing. So um, 
what he's, uh, so I'll tell you my experience of, the, of, of my understanding of the grill from what I heard visiting Daminer and from other discussions with people there and Corset. The grill is a force that has uh, always been around. It's, I, I'm not sure if it comes from the real, but it is a very highly evolved force. It has been searched for, looked for by esoteric teachers and uh, esoteric seekers to be able to harness this energy. And it comes into humanity like it goes in other places of the universe and dimensions, um, helping, giving an impulse of energy to accelerate and uh, to accelerate uh, evolution. And when I was, I didn't know any of this. When I was in Daminer my first time, I had, um, I was at their Thursday meetings that they always hold. And during these Thursday meetings, Falco came and he wasn't in person because that's the weekend he died, actually. I didn't know at the time. This was seven years ago. Uh, he was on the phone. He was very weak. I had no idea. I just thought he was a very mellow guy. I had no idea that he was passing. Uh, but the, they asked him a couple of questions and about the grail. And they said, what level is the grail at? And he replied, and I, re I wrote these things down because it was so, I knew it was important. I just didn't know the context. And what level is the grail at? And he said, it's at the sixth level. So since then I've taught, I've, I've learned that the grail has come as a chalice. The grail has come as the sword, as the shroud. Uh, usually the elements that contain the grail, or the, the, the forms that contain the grail are very holy because it's a very big energy. And a lot of people have searched for the grail. Um, what was, um, even I think Hitler was after the grail because he knew um, of the power of this uh, force. He was a big esoteric person for the dark, but he was also searching for this power. And so, the, so what he says, okay, so it looks like the, the so the, it means that the grail is now in a new form. So it's at the sixth, sixth level. And then they ask, what form is it in? And he said, disease, malatia. And uh, so what Coyote said in his Facebook is, okay, not only do we have right now this uh, opening of uh, the divine attention, which makes this time very potent, but we have this virus, whether you believe in it or not, doesn't matter, but it's a disease. And so it's very likely that present right now with all of us is the grail. And what's fantastic is, uh, what's fantastic because it is, it's a very powerful moment is the grail has been always in the hands of a few of the masters of, of the, the few that study esoteric teachings or that are studying the mysteries. Now we have it in a form that can touch everybody. So this is a really exquisite time for us as you know, human beings for evolution. So, so what he said in the, in, in the, in the presentation, in his talk was, so you have two things happening, this divine attention, and then you have this grail that's probably coming through this huge force and it's touching everybody in one way or another. And so that was Coyote's presentation. And another element that we find in the book, you know, the grail, so it gives another practical uh, understanding of what might be happening right now. And then, um, I mean, uh, Krautolo in Sunday's presentation said many things. And just to add to this is he talked about the age of Aquarius astrologically since the 60s. We've been under the age of Aquarius, which is the reawakening, the community, the spirituality. So we have these incredible forces all at play. And you can believe this is also something that comes from Coyote's, uh, what he mentioned is any groups or, you know, present on the planet or somewhere else uh, has been working really hard to help humanity awaken. And in this age of Aquarius, it's also a very potent time. So if we are living this experience right now, it's because we have really a mix 
<laughs> of a lot of interesting elements. So I want to open it up if you guys want to make a comment before we go into the material, uh, if you want to say some reflections um, or, or some comments. Go ahead, Cindy. Um, I just thought it was interesting. My daughter's been trying for two and a half years to get pregnant. Uh -huh. And she's pregnant and she's due December 31st. And I told her this about the, she has experiences in her life, but I told her this, um, what Crotula said. And she said, mom, I have a feeling this is a very special baby and was waiting for this time because she yes. said she tried so hard. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Mm. And, and I, have, I have one of these babies that was born at the last, uh, because th th this is just, um, it's really fast, this one. I think the last one happened in 1994 to 97, and I have a 97 baby. It's like she sprinkled with stardust. Really? It's mm -hmm. like she's, there's something, there's something very, yeah, she sprinkled with, I look at, I just have to get out of the way because I'm just like, like she manifests uh, stuff that I've never seen. Like, it's just like, I'm in awe. It's like, okay, you're yeah, star child. At first I was, when she told me, I was like, oh, Millie, now, <laughs> thinking, now the virus, she told me a few weeks ago, but now after Crotolo, I was pretty excited. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> nice. nice. Chacha, do you want to say something? Anything, any, this is a big topic, huh? Well, I just, one thing, I, I mean, you said that it's touching everybody. I mean, it's because of the coronavirus, because we're all aware of this. Is that what he meant by that? It's, it's uh, touching all of us? Yes. Uh, if the grail uh, is said to be in the form of a disease, anybody who is experiencing an illness of any kind uh, is, go is, is being touched it is being touched by the grail. This has never happened before, not to this kind, not so diffused. So I think it was very interesting when the pandemic started. I mean, the, the Damanurians at the beginning were enthusiastic, were like, yes, this is what we've been waiting for. Everybody's gonna get a shot of this energy, you know? Uh, not realizing now that, oh my gosh, you know, what a catastrophe, but, but it, it does. I mean, think of it, you know, this is also interesting. Think of it, and, and Krautolo mentioned it, he goes, it's the sofa revolution. What did he call it? The sofa. You know, we've there's been move moments of change throughout history, but they usually have been it was always war, big time war. Yes, it was always big time war, and now it's just you know people watching TV and watching the internet. So, out of all the experiences we can have, it is the most uh, with it is the most uh, offered with grace. So. It could be, you know, it's, it could be this energy that is definitely the, the grail is work with us, whether we are touched personally or whether we are touched by what's happening. Yeah, and just to add to that, so the woman, one of the, uh, a woman that I follow says that it was that we manifested this COVID, like we did it, us, we brought it in, we needed it sounds really awful if people don't understand what we're talking about, but as like a consciousness, we needed it. We needed to bring in the grail, right? Like, it's oh, time. Yes, that's a nice perspective. That's a really mm -hmm. nice perspective. Yes, yes, we brought it in because we needed that. Yeah, mm -hmm. possibly to make this jump and all this work by all the people that are awakening and mm -hmm. spiritual. That's a really nice way to look at it, actually. Mm -hmm. We actually you know, we're ready for this change. And this was the way we were graced or blessed by this, uh, by this moment. Yeah, that's a beautiful way. And Duncan, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? Do you want to say something? Um, no. No? <laughs> Listen, that's good too. That works too. That works too. Let's get but, on, the, on to the... So honest. Yeah, let's get on the book. Okay. We have questions okay. about the book. So let, let, about the next let, chapter. Uh, sorry? We have questions about the next chapter. Okay. Uh, which, uh, so we, we, I'm the element of ancient human history. Is that the one or the human soul? Yeah. 
the that's one the one just, yeah Okay, so I, you know, I was going to summarize this. Uh, oh, hello, hello, welcome. <laughs> I'm not staying for long. Okay, Hi, that's sorry, okay. I'm nice to see you. Nice, nice to see you. I'm here to see your beautiful face. Oh, I'm my goodness. Here. That's so nice. nice that's so you, nice. Honey. Hi, everybody. Hello, Helen. Hello. Who has single-handedly inspired three of you to go and do the lab of life. <laughs> Don't blame me. Oh, Cindy, did you go? No, no. Oh. August 16th now. You ha you're on mute. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello. Um, I sent my money and now I'm just waiting to hear when the date is. Right. Mm. Good luck with that. Good luck, good luck. <laughs> okay, guys. So listen, uh, so what I wanted to do for the element of the ancient human history, I mean, I can summarize it, but it is really only three and a half pages, and it's written in a way that is clear. So I would like to read it, if that's okay for you guys. Is that good? So, Element of Ancient History, page 99. Here we go. Okay, we will now be examining this subject in depth, as there are many other books that do so, but we would like to highlight a few important events and their consequences that allow for a more complete understanding of the topic presented in other chapters. We will therefore begin with the mythical golden age, a period that has been lost in the folds of time. It is impossible to date it with any precision and during which mankind was still in full possessions of their divine potential. What we really are speaking of in this context is a true universal empire, expanding through time and space, comprised of millions of worlds, including a part of our own galaxy, and inhabited by a wide variety of life forms, all of which were integrated into the concept of the human soul. Presumably, we could be speaking of a period of about 600,000 years ago. So you can imagine when we first, when we evolved, this is what we were capable of. We were across all galaxies, universes, we were quite a force. Uh, and we had full uh, capacity of all our divine um, aspects. Uh, the development of our species at this superior level first took place on very distant worlds and only at a much later point in time did the evolution evolved human species reach the earth where there are there was already a native species though at quite an inferior level so uh, anything you study in religion bye bye <laughs> We were made in the stars somewhere, and that's where we evolved. <laughs> okay, for a certain period, the golden age, man, uh, the golden age, mankind was able to create and evolve an evolved civilization that was perfectly integrated with the other species that shared the planet. We can still find traces of this, mostly in the book of science fiction. Uh, written by Falco. However, at a certain point, human civilization, as it continued with its expansion into space, encountered species that later on would turn out to be extremely dangerous. So this is interesting when we find out uh, <clears throat> when you are very evolved, how you experience another race. This is fascinating. Okay, these were beginnings, um, these were beings that sought nothingness, non-existence as a goal and possessed the same knowledge and technology as humankind. They were also spreading and expanding through space, but with only one objective, to annihilate every form of life and complexity that they could find. Sounds like Star Wars, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Initially, mankind did not understand the true nature of the species and has had already happened in many other cases. 
willingly shared its soul with them, an operation that would probably be defined as genetic engineering in this day and age. When the true nature of these forms was revealed, there began an epic war between mankind and his enemy. Unfortunately, mankind lost four major battles, having allowed itself in its na naivete to become contaminated from within. These four losses took place in times that were quite distant from one another, though they were all traceable to the same story. And the result of each of these losses were dramatic. Mankind was lobotomized, deprived of some of its fundamental archetypes, males and females became divided, and human beings lost the ability to communicate with other species. These moments often coincide with, whoa, there was a mosquito. <laughs> These moments often coincided with grand scale physical destruction on the planet. The destruction of Atlantis, for example, which took place between Duncan and Helen, can you mute yourself? I'm getting some noise. Helen, can you mute yourself? I'm going to probably. There, there you go. Perfect. Super, super, super. Okay. Um, which took place. Okay. So the, uh, the moment often uh, coincided with grand scale physical destruction on the planet. The destruction of Atlantis, for example, which took place between 1200 and 1500 years ago, uh, and probably represented the last of the four battles lost by humankind. In the interval between one phase and another, mankind repeatedly engaged in extreme efforts to recover. Uh, with some fairly impressive results. We can again mention the examples of Atlantis, which was not only the last great human civilization, but one which developed after mankind had already lost multiple battles. From these few lines, we can understand that we are summing up an extremely long story, and one that does not always have a clear chronology. Keep in mind that in many cases, the subjects of the story, the subjects of these stories were traveling in time since they were possess in, in possessions of the appropriate technology. That means time travel was going on on the plane of time. But in an effort to provide at least a reference of dates, we can say around 75,000 years ago, the idea of esotericism, uh, uh, esoteric teachings was formed exactly as it is understood today, brought about by the need to transmit knowledge in secret as to hide it from the enemy. It is also the time when the star masters revealed themselves, individuals who were able to avoid being lobotomized and to keep their consciousness intact. 35,600 years ago, mankind lost its understanding of the unity within the concept of divinity. This brought about the separation of, div of the divinities and subsequently loss of control over them, as well as giving birth to the first conflicts in the name of territory. This concept was regained only a short time ago thanks to the triad operation. What this point talks about is, remember we talked about all the divine forces that mankind um, have, uh, <laughs> Helen is just saying by, uh, that mankind have um, been devoted to over the years. We've created all these divine forces. When, um, at some, because we don't have our full faculties, we lost control of the divine forces. And instead of becoming our allies, uh, they started to feed on our energy. So they were actually misguiding us. They cannot lie, but they were misguiding us. So for a long time, uh, we have been under the influence, not positively, of the divine forces we had created. So uh, 35,000 years ago, we lost 
control of them. And uh, Falco, one of the other operations he did, not only did he split the plane of time, but he was able, with the help of the energy of the grail and other elements, which we'll see later on with the magical technology, uh, to reorient all these divine forces under a triad, three, three forces. So that's, uh, uh, that's important. That also explains why the time packet we were on got cut short, because they were able to awaken one, uh, all, these co all these combined divine forces, there's three of them, under, um, they, they've already done two. This was one of the, there was the one that was awakened two years ago was Bastet, which represents the feminine force. And under her are many, many, many other divinities that were all organized. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. So what are those three, what are the three uh, forces? We're going to talk about them later. They have their own chapter. Uh, okay. the, three forces, the three forces are, think of all the divinities of humankind. When we went to the labyrinth, we saw all the pictures of all the divine forces that the planet as or humankind has ever de devoted to. Um, they were all merged. You know, they had marriages, they had events, they, they merged all these energies to create three main ones at the top, Horus being one of them, but it's not the Horus of Egypt, it's a Horus that has underneath it many other um, uh, divinities that mankind has worshipped throughout the ages. Bastet was the female one, and um, she was awakened, I think, in, two th in 2017. That's why the eye opened earlier on the time packet. And uh, uh, Pan is the last one, and that represents the Earth. And so these are the three main forces. They're not like their original ones that we know of, but they, they, they were chosen. My understanding is there's some divine forces that never turned against mankind. And these are the three, and that's why they were chosen as the three prime ones on, on which all the others fell, or went under. So it's a cleaner of energy. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it. Okay. So I'll just keep going. So that started, we lost control of those forces 35,600 years ago, and we regained it just recently under the operation of the triad that we're gonna cover. Um, and then 22,000 years ago, there we are in the Atlantean area, area. The first important point for the program of mankind's reawakening was created. This is the same point that was visited by Damanurian travelers in 1994. So I want to share with you that uh, Falco and uh, when we do Atlantis and ancient civilization, there will be pictures traveled to Atlantis um, to exchange information. Uh, and he brought a, paint, a painter with him, a visual artist, who when he came back for three days, him and Falco painted. And a lot of the pictures we have, because when you time travel, you go naked, you can't bring anything with you. And uh, so they brought back images. Uh, because like we found out from the time chapter we did, when there is a break in the fabric of time that happens when there's such a huge destruction of matter, which is what happened in Atlantis, the time of Atlantis, when it disappeared, um, it's very hard for us to get any artifacts from there because they're really on a very thin layer of the timeline. So uh, these paintings were valuable to bring back images to hopefully catalyze something in, in us, you know. Uh, and about 12,000 years ago, the knowledge necessary for the programming of reincarnation was regained, which is important um, so that you know, souls can come back and not have to start completely from scratch. Uh, I guess the Tibetans would be the ones we are all familiar with, but there's others that are able to pass this on. And I think also the Damanurians have this knowledge. So uh, many events told through the ages in the form of myths 
are actually integral pieces of these true stories, such as the story of the temptation in Genesis and the ambiguous figure of Lucifer, some involving very important changes that affected the entire human race. Mm -hmm. One Damanurian's interpretation of these events view Lucifer as the remnants of uh, remnants left by another primeval divinity's attempt to enter form, a figure just like the others left over from previous games played, was deprived of its. Oh, okay, wait, wait. Yeah, was deprived of its free will. Wait, wait. A figure just like the others left over from previous games played was deprived of its free will and took on an angelic function acting as laws placed in certain points of the game board represented by the world of form. Lucifer in particular was eventually able to regain free will and enter fully in the new game, even reaching the point of being mankind's representative during very delicate phases of human history. So what I wanna clarify here is we have been told that one, there's nine primordial divinities, one at a time can come and have uh, their experience uh, here at, this, at, the, uh, at once, the one at a time has to come. What happened with the three other primeval divinities that came, uh, they didn't succeed, but those um, forms that reached a certain level of evolution were able to stay. So all the archangels are part of these previous primeval divinities. They didn't reach full enlightenment, but reached a certain level of evolution that they were able to stay. Most of them are the, these are the angels, the angelic, uh, the archangels that we are familiar with. Uh, they can help us. Uh, and they, can, they, they cannot evolve anymore. They cannot evolve. Uh, except, and, and, they, and they don't have free will, you know, uh, they are not as, um, as, they're not as capable here as we are, but they are forms with a particular energy that we can, uh, that can help us. Lucifer, for whatever reason, was able to reacquire free will, and he, according to this, has helped humanity as well. So this is an interesting concept um, uh, of how we did this. I don't think we talk about it in here, but it's an interesting topic if we ever get Coyote on the phone, on, on the call. <laughs> so one of the four great losses by humankind uh, could coincide with man's entry in an earthly paradise. Oh, okay, wait, wait. So let, let me just say, so this is Lucifer. They, they talk a little bit about Lucifer's um, after presence here. So uh, we talked about Lucifer and this is how he acted with humankind. So one of the four great losses by humankind could coincide with man's entry in an earthly paradise presented by Christianity as Eden, but which was actually a prison in which man was deprived of free will. According to one interpretation, it was Lucifer himself who caused him to, uh, who caused him, who caused this to happen. Have he succumbed to the temptation offered by enemy forces in his role as mankind's representative? Yet it was also Lucifer who later on, and as described in the Bible, allowed men to escape from paradise and regain free will the apple eaten by Eve. Isn't that interesting to turn? So Lucifer was a force. Uh, he got, he was supposed to be an angelic force, you know, but he, because he's got this free will, he can choose. He doesn't have just one way to act. And he chose to be influenced by uh, the enemy and bring us in a garden of evil, strip us of free will. And then in the same gesture, he did this. So it gives another perspective to the story of the Bible. In this case, the events are obviously colored by myths and are therefore much more difficult to date. Generally speaking, we can divide human history into three great ages. 
the golden age described at the beginning of this chapter, the decline of human civilization, including the various phases in which it lost the great battles against the enemy. We are actually talking about a very complex histor historical period during which there was continuous change in the balance of power, resulting in the long run in humankind giving way. And the attempt at reawakening, a grand scale and very ambitious project that throughout, though planned at the time of Atlantis, Atlantis's fall, actually starts now in our modern age and includes Daminer as one of its important uh, elements. My personal interpretation uh, views the golden age as something that was uh, prophesized, but which does not actually exist in the real. Therefore, it represents a future goal. Conversely, events that seem to have taken place in the distant past could actually relate to contemporary situations. Paradise on earth could exist in our own time, for example, or humankind losing to the enemy could be a future risk if our civilization, civilization follows a certain path. But to add some more confusion to an already confusing stew of possibilities and idea, let us return to one of Falco's latest statement regarding time. It would seem that our universe has a time trajectory that aims towards the past and not as we have always believed towards the future. <laughs> I'm gonna open that up <laughs> for some comments. <laughs> Yeah, I understand this totally. I just could not repeat it. Yeah. It is so true. It's profound, eh? Yeah, it has. I mean, that's why we studied time. You know, it's a plane. Past, present, and future are all happening at the same time. You know, so when you put those elements in, because we are used to a three-dimensional world and nobody has helped us develop these higher faculties, we cannot see all the possibilities. You know, it's coming because we have this potential. You know, it's coming. But if we could see the world from a 10 dimensional perspective, uh, then all these possibilities, we could, we could see all these things simultaneously. I like to refer to, this is the work of Alex Gray, you know, like this is what is seen in the invisible. You know, I can imagine if we could navigate that and see it daily in our lives. So this, this study of this book, the practical aspect is it starts to give us some nourishment to our imagination. So we can start to maybe bring back some of these know knowings on a more concrete level, you know. So that's, uh, that's the idea. Any comments? Because the next one is the structure of the human soul, and that is quite a topic. <laughs> I love that part. That is what I do. I do soul readings. So this oh. is a whole different way, paradigm to impose upon the soul and oh provide new information. Can I you, just, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You go. No, I just something about the, that last comment by Falco. And I'm thinking, okay, so he's kind of saying that, or he is saying that we're actually not progressing, but we have the, the ability to do so. And I'm just thinking, when we were at the stage of the Atlanteans, and even though they were defeated before Atlantis came to be, there were still a good number of people who were, if you want to call, call them enlightened or whatever it is, acting on more than the third dimension, say that. Um, we got a long way to go. I'm just trying to figure out how do we get more people on board? <laughs> the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is it, there's not many. Yeah, there's, the, we're always finding more within our group and other groups that we connect with, yeah. Yeah. but they're still really small and there's got to be like you say you know there's there's catalysts out there that we have to find and yeah. i think that'll that'll help things but just if, if we keep going the way we're going yeah 
I, y yes, I listen, um, definitely all, all of that, uh, Duncan. Um, when I read this, you know, it's interesting because I've read this book many times. And then when I read it this time, you know, I didn't pick this up. I, I get another idea. If in the past we were more evolved, right? We were galactic, you know, empires, um, you know, being with all different forms, merging with all different forms, capable of communicating with different species. And if maybe we are going towards the past, maybe we don't want to go to the future, maybe we want to go to the past and bring that back, you know, so maybe, you know, it's a, it's a, maybe that's another direction, you know, hey, maybe we don't have to go that way, we can just go back because we were way better that way. So anyway, it's, it's just a game, a, a play on words, but this time when I read it, I was like, oh, that's, I like that. Like we can go back to <laughs> the time of Atlantis or 600,000 years ago when we had these incredible, yeah, um, empires. Uh, yeah, the science fiction side. I'm thinking the more people that learn to time travel, the faster we can do this. I've been told, I have been told, Duncan, that many of us that are interested in this topic are time travelers. It's very possible we are all coming from the future or the past and we are here because in Atlantis they created the, this project to reawaken humanity. They knew Atlantis was not going to do well and they did it to happen at yeah, um, at the age of Aquar Aquarius, when I speak to Damanurians that uh, have, had, you know, went there and stayed, it's because when they walked into the temple or when they had the experience, they knew, like, it's like, okay, I'm here. It's like, you know, like, we don't know, but till we see it, right? And then it's like, oh, geez, we're here. Um, so I think many of us interested in this topic coming together are time travelers. That's what I've been told. Not only are we made of stardust, but we're time travelers. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> and I, yeah, yeah. And I also really, you know, it's funny when people ask me, you know, what about Damaner, and the best way I can describe it is, it's a mix between Star Wars and Hogwarts. You know, Hogwarts was J.K. Rowling's, uh, you know, book, uh, Harry Potter. <coughs> And Star Steel Spielberg Star Wars. I think it's a perfect make. This is, and and maybe it's not by chance that these stories are out there, you know, because somewhere we know this story. So fun. So now, if that was not enough, wait till we get to the human soul. <laughs> we got some questions on this one. I tell you. <laughs> you wow. uh, can I just ask? Can I? turn this sideways just a little bit. I yes. think um, Crotolo on Sunday, he said that he has Gaia TV coming to Damanur to do yes. 10 more episodes. Is this going to be on Atlantis? Or do oh, you know um, what subject? He told me and I can't remember. I, I, uh, I thought it was going to be just on Damanur. Maybe on Damanur, maybe the temple, time travel could be the time okay. machine, you could, uh, uh, I don't remember, but he told me. I, I doubt if he would want to advertise the time machine. I, they, I think, I think that's ahead, yeah. for them. I don't think they really want the whole world to know about the time machine there. Some Eva, people aren't for it. Eva, I have to tell you that when, uh, uh, was it ET, I th when will, which one came first? I can't remember. But Steven Spielberg, when he made one of his first movies, whether right. it was E.T. or Star Wars, they, they did get invited to Damanhur because Falco wanted to show them the time travel machine. Oh. And, yeah. then, and then they got such heat that they stopped. They, they, it was not a good time. It was not the right time. So they, you're right, Eva, they did it when Falco was there. He wanted to bring, when those kinds of movies started to come out, he wanted to bring that mm -hmm. uh, forward. Oh, I don't know if you guys saw, I know it's a little bit off topic, but I want to share with you. Uh, CNN um, 
on at 4 a.m. in the morning two weeks ago, I think I might have sent it to you guys, finally uh, revealed two videos of UFOs uh, that uh, a fighter jet was following. And it's so brilliant because finally saying UFOs, unidentified flying objects, here's the first release. Okay, it happened at four o'clock in the morning, but it was CNN. Did, did I send it to you guys? No. I didn't. No, I have to send it to you. Okay. Make a note to send you that. Okay. CNN. Okay. So it is time to venture into the, hum the structure of the human soul. Hmm. Now, uh, do I take you through, let me, let me just say, I've sort of um, had done it in a presentation kind of way, similar a little bit. Uh, do we want to go through that or do you guys want to ask your questions and then we go through it? Which, which way would you prefer? Um, our question is on the first chat. It's on the first paragraph. I don't know if you want to read that. The first I was going to read. I, so I was going to read the first page. Okay. <laughs> so let's read the first page and then you can ask away. Okay. Yeah. Now, so, Sandra, do it your way. Yeah. And Ask questions around okay, it. Okay, okay. Uh, the struct, okay, here we go. This is the structure of the human soul. So some things are going to resonate and other things you're going to be stretched, but it's good for you. Okay, so uh, according to the teachings of the Damanurian school, the soul is a complex structure composed of many parts, just like our bodies. In this chapter, we will see how a human soul is formed and what exactly are the different parts that compose it. But first, before all else, we must make the following point according to the theory achieved by our school. The soul has a simultaneous presence in at least four different living forms at once. The most important being the human form while the others can be animal or plant forms. Being, it, being in complete command of our soul and having the consciousness of the different forms that shape it is a very complicated affair and requires a high level of evolution that is not easy to reach, one that we define as enlightenment. In this book, we shall be looking at the parts of the soul that lodges with the human form to the exclusion of the others because we do not yet have any practical experiences with those parts and we are therefore unable at our current level of consciousness to explore them. But we should point out that this is a very important point. If, obli if oblige us, it ob obliges us to think the way we view animals and consider that they may form part of the human soul. Okay, Duncan and Elizabeth, what would you like to say? This is this is really the taste. Eh? This wait, this is there's a rabbit hole here. <laughs> yeah, it's like all about numbers. Yeah. So previously we learned that <clears throat> there could be as many as six different timelines that our souls could be a part of. Mm -hmm dimensions or timeline um, now here we're talking about four simultaneous which I'm making an assumption that they're all on the same timeline but are there are there four different ones on the other five <laughs> Okay. Such good questions. That's a good question. So, uh, so my understanding, and this is a question, can you write this one down? Because this could be also a question for Coyote. I'm Are you recording? You're recording. Yeah, I'm recording. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, you know what, when I go through the recordings, because I'm editing them, uh, I'm going to put them in a podcast. So I'll edit them and I'll get these questions in there. So let me see if I understand you're wondering the the soul as we hear here is in four different forms or it says at least four there could also be more right there are more yes there so could. we have we have six more 
Go yeah. And then, so you've got the soul being in the different forms here on this planet. And then you've got these different mm -hmm. time branches that we can be on. And like, oh my goodness, where are we? And my understanding is the soul is capable of all this. And it's our consciousness that moves. The soul is able to transcend, to do all this. It's we're, we're, we're really pliable and malleable. It, and it's the consciousness that moves from one to the other. And so the soul can be on all these timelines and have no difficulties, just like we are in an animal form and in a plant form, but we're not aware of it. So even when I was explained the human primordial divinity, it is whole in the real, but broken down here, but it is still whole in itself. It's still connected to itself. So it's the same kind of idea. Does that help you? Does that, no. So that means that we are, that our soul is in a plant, an animal, in a human body, all at the same time. Yes, and our poor little brain and consciousness, doesn't have the capacity to keep up <laughs> but our soul is having multi multi experiences on all these planes so yes well if we invent a cereal that can <laughs> enlighten those other parts of your brain i think we're on to something i think that might be why it's not i think that's maybe why we have it yeah. but that's a much what's the percentage we use Three oh, percent. No, Ten percent. So if okay, so think about it. If we were lobotomized, we were male and female, all in one. We were androgen, uh, androgenous, mm -hmm. and we had all these other faculties. We were quite complex, so we were able. To, so that's why for us to reach that kind of level of evolution was much easier, because we were just so multi-dimensional in our own way you know so all of that was we're really back to basics eh? in our construct we were really yeah but it's funny when um when i mentioned on that call on sunday in my question about the uh a fellow damanurian that mentioned something that was a spare day in uh, one of these humanity rising um talks and and you you know if we when you've been to the uh temples and there are androgynous images on the wall and because they know that's the next step where we're actually going back because that's the way it used to be that's when things really worked well because we didn't have we've been fighting ever since we've been separated as horrible as that sounds you know but you know it sounds like when you listen to somebody from Daminer that lives and, and meditates in that world, then, uh, you know, this is the next step and then we're not that far away. So that's why we're going back. There's gotta be, we're missing, there's some missing parts here. Let's start. I, 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 want, I want to um, really in, uh, share this because we might have mentioned it before, but I've heard it many times uh, in their presence. And also uh, when they talk about Falco, in every moment, you guys, we have the capacity to become enlightened. If we align with something or we get it like in every moment. And I think somebody shared with me that Falco was at dinner. There was three of them. And he looked at them, he goes, guys, right now, if you want, it's yours. And they're all like, oh, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know, we think it's this big thing. Needless to say, no, nobody did it. But just to say, like, if we, if we, there is, it's uh, it, for how difficult it can be, it is also possible. It's available in every moment. So. Thank you. You know, maybe the opportunity, maybe what it is for us is to walk around with that certainty that we can have it at any moment we desire. 
and maybe that will help bring it in like we brought in the grill and I'm, I'm just offering that yeah because it's the oh conjecture we just have to live it it's much better than going step by step by step I mean, we have to do yeah. the steps we're in motion you know and we're working our brains here so i think we're definitely qualify as being in motion because this is not a topic that many people want to study and alessandra i think you are getting the light not in a pun way because you have a light coming straight into your head and through your and through your forehead and your nose yeah and i guess yeah. it's my light <laughs> nice Okay, it's my so enlightened. Guys, come hold hands. Come down the yellow brick road. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's uh, that's why I'm doing this, and that's why I'm going to do the podcast to simplify all these discussions, mm -hmm. make them smaller, mm -hmm. more digestible. Try to get this information out in a really simple way, so more people can start to think like this. Uh, we we all do our part, you know. So this is important. So beautiful people, we can, uh, well, uh, any other questions? Should we continue? Oh, no, human soul, human soul. You want human soul, okay. I'm gonna okay. try to take you through this crash course of human soul. So we've got that and then I wanna lead, I, I wanna just read this sentence on page 106. So, so the soul is the evolutionary result of the fragment of the human primordial divinity. So we have to, so how do we arrive at the soul? It's a process. So the human primordial divinity is having a human ex an experience in matter. It breaks into all these little shards of the mirror that are everywhere in matter. And matter now with all the elements we discussed before starts to you know, go towards complexity, starts to evolve itself. These little shards have more experiences, they go f and, and they start to become more and more complex, more and more evolved. Um, I want to bring back the element of the, the real here. Remember the real can, is only an observer, can interfere as the primordial divinity is having its experience, but it can, Send, um, uh, it, it can participate with those different attractors, the four different attractors that we discussed in page 58. I just want to bring them in because you have the, how is the soul created? The soul gets created by evolution. To see the evolution, we first have to go back to the shard of the mirror. That's the first uh, a fragment that is in the matter. This fragment over time gets evolved and we know all the elements, the laws, the nothingness, the demiurges, all of those elements. So it continuously gets evolved. The real also participates, not directly, but through these attractors. There are four attractors, the macro attractors that are in divine forces, the attractors that are in the human soul, the micro micro attractors and um, the micro micro attractors. So I mentioned those because as the divine spark, I, I, no, as the, the fragment of the mirror is in matter having its experience, it's leaving its inf evolution and it's, it, it's, it's gathering pra uh, practical experiences and it's gathering memory from these experiences. It leaves them in the threshold. Remember it's the attractors that come down from the real pick up the memories that are left in the threshold, come into matter, gather the information that matter experiences, come back through the threshold, leave all the memories in the threshold. So I wanted to give you the two pieces that are important, the little fragment of the mirror that is gathering experiences and the attractor that comes from the real and up and back up from the real down to matter and from matter back to the real, leaving all the memories that matter is having in the threshold. So the threshold becomes a place where all the experiences that the little divine spark has in matter get left. Some 
memories are more evolved. A rock might not be as evolved as a bird or might not be as evolved as, an, as, as other species. So, but all those memories are left in the threshold. Just give me a thumbs up if that's clear. Uh, I, I lost, Chacha, I lost you a little bit. Just give me a thumbs up. Okay, okay. So, so we've got um, the human primordial divinity. It's pieces of the mirror are in matter. They're getting experiences. They're becoming evolved. They, let, they leave every experience, uh, all their memories in the threshold. Um, and then the attractors come back in, take that memory, bring it back into the material world, and so on. So the evolution of complexity begins. The, the more knowledge is being f created in the memories as more and more experiences happen. So that's the one, the first level. These memories that are left in the threshold start when they get more and more complex, starts to be called knots of intelligence. And when these knots of intelligence, because they accumulate more over time and more knowledge, these knots of intelligence, when they finally reach a certain mass, all of a sudden they reach a level where they grow. They do an evolutionary jump. And when this happened, the divine, the divine spark that's always been inside of them awakens. And in this awakening, so you have to have this memory in the form that reaches a certain level of complexity, evolution. When it does, innate in its way, in, its, in what's inside of it, becomes awakened, the divine spark. And boom, with that awakening, you've got a jump in evolution, you've got memory, you've got consciousness, you've got access to the free will. And now you have the possibility, you have the beginning of the human soul. Okay, that's the structure of how it happens. Um, the next, the next part is, uh, so I just want to recap it for you. So the information that is left in the threshold by these, the attractors, the real, uh, is the memory of the form. It becomes more and more complex as it builds experiences and they become known, these, these, these memories, as knots of intelligence. Then once these knots of intelligence reach a certain level, they do an evolutionary jump and they become, um, the divine spark ignites in them. They become, they regain their memory, they regain their consciousness, they regain free will. And this is where the human soul begins. And the next is, so now, this is important, the human soul is no longer these memories of form. The human soul now, um, the, the, this, uh, the knot of intelligence that now has the divine spark transforms into pers a personality because now this, it's no longer the knot of intelligence but becomes a personality which is gathering memories from our previous lives. So this, what happens in this evolutionary jump from the knot of intelligent to getting the divine spark, all of a sudden we're not leaving a memory in a form in the threshold. We're leaving a memory of our lived experience as a soul. So all of a sudden we don't have knots of intelligence. We have what is called personalities and the personalities are the individual's memory linked uh, to having a divine spark. And these personality are created over various incarnations. So I want to now read 108 and 109 <laughs> because, <laughs> first give me a thumbs up if this is, uh, if you understood this. Thumbs up. Uh, do you want to? Do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. 
um, it says in here, I can't remember where, but on these pages, um, that the personalities or the memories that go into a person five or six days before they're born can be a mix of a lot of people that have passed. And yeah, this it's like, as well as your past lives, memories from some of your past lives, as well as memories from other people. And it's like, I think if more, if more people understood that, you know, we could focus on trying to, you know, past life regression, whatever it takes to, if you're having, because we always have uh, confusion and it's saying a lot of reasons that's why. But, um, I'm just wondering, is there, is there some path you can take to assimilate them so they, they work well together? That's the goal of the human, the dominant, the soul, to integrate, take all those pieces and just move together. Welcome to you know, the this, school of... This, sorry, this whole thing, just briefly, I was, I was reading this and it says, this is the exact simulation of trying to build a community. It's yeah, what goes exactly. on in your soul. Yes. It's amazing. Yes. yes. Yeah. Really good. Anyway. That's Welcome it. to life. <laughs> and complexity. <laughs> no, listen. Um, you're right, Duncan, because when we start to, and this page is talks, this, the two pages I'm going to read, 108 and 109, talk about what happens. Any attachment we have to who we are, and we like one aspect of ourselves more than the other, throw it out the window. Because <laughs> It's so irrelevant to the whole scheme of things. <laughs> so when you say, is this practical? It's very practical to help us let go of a lot of things. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So page 108 and 109, I'm going to read again, because uh, I think it's well written and uh, I can use it uh, to explain. So, so now we know how um, the soul uh, comes into being uh, by the process of evolution. Uh, we no longer have knots of just intelligence, which are just memory, but we actually have these personalities now uh, that have memory, have um, consciousness, free will that are left in the threshold. And we get to play with these personalities and they, you know, whoever created this game was really creating a very interesting game because it's really, it's, it's very fascinating. So, so now that we understood the framework, we're going to go to this uh, page 108. So at the bottom paragraph, at this point, a corresponding attractor moves from the real, okay, so now we, we, okay, I'll explain it after. At this point, a corresponding attractor moves from the real to the threshold where it finds the storehouse of personalities. So uh, these are the memories of incarnated individuals that are waiting for their next opportunity to reincarnate. Uh, okay, well, maybe before I start here. Okay, no, no, let me start the paragraph above. Let's scratch that. Let me start the paragraph above so that I take you along. So now we have the idea. So after dealing with the origin of the personalities, we know where they're coming from, past lives left in the threshold. We can now move on to consider what the human soul consists of. A body about to be born in the material domain is the signal that attracts the soul. Now it talks about how it happens. So at this point, a corresponding attractor moves from the real to the threshold where it finds, and I emphasize this, the storehouses of the storehouse of personalities. These are the memories of incarnated individuals that are waiting for their next opportunity to reincarnate. According to a specific programming, maximizing the attractor's own intelligence 
which remember is the absolute principle, the real in matter, the attractor summons, summons a certain number of personalities ranging from a minimum of seven to eight with less than five personality. We cannot speak of a human soul as that level of, as that the level of complexity would not be sufficient to a maximum of 70 to 80 personalities. The peculiarity of this theory lies in the fact that these personalities belong to different deceased individuals, each with their unique characteristics who have lived in different periods of time and therefore do not relate to one another. When the attractor summons them, they become part of the same soul. And this new, newly formed structure, attractor and personality enters the body about five to six days before birth. <laughs> Can we all take a pause? <laughs> How do you guys feel after that? <laughs> this, this, this is uh, an explanation for schizophrenia. Yeah. And the different uh, fighting, you know, the wolves fighting within us. Yeah. Agendas. Yes. But, but, but get to the punchline. How do we. Okay, no, there's more. No, the punchline is huge. We might have to go longer. If you, are you guys okay to go till nine? I think we need the punchline. Okay. The, okay the, no, the punchline. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. The punchline is none of this is important. It's fundamental to get us to where we want to go, but it's yeah. not what we need to get stuck on. <laughs> okay, for the punchline. Wait till you get to the end of the chapter. So you break your heads to have all these personalities. You have to integrate so you can become enlightened. And then when you think you got it, guess what? That's not even the key. <laughs> So there you go. That's if I gave it to you before I gave you the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's say now you guys okay to continue or should I leave? Yeah, yeah. Are you guys okay to continue? Eva? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep reading because this is good. Okay. So personalities can be male or female depending on their origin, but this has no specific relevance to the body gender. Every individual contains both types of personality, which interacting among themselves produce elements that are essential for our soul's evolution. According to mythological traditions, human beings were once androgynous, which meant that their male and female aspects were not separated. The separation being a limiting condition imposed on human beings as a consequence of their defeat by the enemy. At this point, the various personalities settle in precise body parts and or organs of the person in question. So we will have a personality that lives in the heart, another in the lung, in the liver, in the kidney, and so on. Now, let me just, I wanna go to, I've summarized the rest of the chapter and I can read from my notes because I think it's gonna be easier than reading from the book, but we'll go back. So now, so some of us may, yes, go ahead. Just, um, I, I have a friend writing a book on transgender, watched something on Uplift and I'm like, maybe that's it. I wouldn't they be come surprised. in and they don't understand. They're born into a female body, right? Yeah. But this kind of explains it. Like it, you're pulling from a personality and it doesn't, just doesn't feel right. And if the person, uh, and uh, Cha Cha, uh, as we go into this section, I would say the section two, the personalities, you will see that if we don't integrate them, then we get the, these difficulties. When we can integrate them and merge them in a harmonious way, then these difficulties are not so prevalent. Uh, prevalent. Um, so that's, we, we are going to explain a little bit about that and the importance of any kinds of techniques 
that help us bring these personalities or get familiar with these personalities because they're very precise in what they do. They are orchestrated by the absolute, the real. I mean, they are put together for us for a specific purpose. Um, I think it's important that there is a core of our, oh, I think it's going to come now, um, called personality information, which, yeah, it's going to be in this chapter. So at least I set the stage. Now we're going to go and understand the personalities and how they work in the body. Okay. Uh, so when you incarnate and you're a little baby and you're screaming, uh, it could be because you got 70 people in there trying to figure out what the hell you do. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know. It could be pretty freaky. You open the door and all of a sudden you've got all these people and they're freaking out. You go, what am I supposed to do? So that could be the first PTSD experience, you know? That can you imagine? And they can be complete strangers. So we have to recover from the first PTSD experience. It's like, hey! so I had to put that in there. So, okay. Well, then, personalities. So these are my notes from the book because it was easier for me to understand the book with my notes. And I think it's clear. Uh, if you guys want to stop me, just unmute yourself, okay? So personality, the personalities, like I said, from seven to 80, settle in uh, precise body parts. Each of our physical organ have a memory represented by a personality. The brain, the control center, has the dominant personality, which expresses itself more directly through the body uh, to the outside world. All personalities are part, are, are part of a rotating, rotation mechanism where everyone gets a chance to be a dominant personality. This is a law. Uh, this rotation is important because it helps us to evolve and this rotation creates the opportunity that the personalities get to know each other. At birth, we have a team of strangers that comes together. Our work is to integrate all the personalities so we can continue our soul's evolution according to its base program. Our base program remains constant in all our incarnation. That was the punchline. We'll get to it at the end. <laughs> so. Not only do we have to integrate all these personality, but that's not the only objective. <laughs> so if we reach this integration of the personalities, we reach enlightenment. We may be able to integrate only some of the personalities or none at all. The ones we integrate become known as personalities in formation. And as they develop more in our lifetimes, they start to co-pilot the other personalities. So then it gets, the more we have this personality information formed, it will be easier to amalgamate the other ones. We can say that the evolution of an individual can be measured by the quant quality uh, of its personality information. As we mentioned above, the control room of the body is in the brain, schizophrenia, with two personalities controlling it at all times, one living in each hemisphere. So if we're a little confused, pat ourselves on the back, the left hemisphere is rational, the right is emotional. Consequently, we shall always have dominant personalities with opposing characteristics, creating doubt. Doubt is an important internal mechanism. It, it's what allows interaction between the personalities and it helps us integrate our personalities. Once we do that, the control room is more stable and we get clearer directions. Attractors, the real, in form, in, 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 at the threshold, chooses the best mix of the personalities for the mission of that soul for that individual. So you have to believe that the different personalities you have, it's really a divine uh, reason. 
there is a higher purpose uh, for your evolution that they've been put together. To determine and direct the evolutionary program of the individuals, some new forces come into play known as the Lord of Karma. Beings that finish their evolution, they guide reincarnation of the souls and create the right condition to unfold the specific program. So these are called the Lord of Karmas that help. This, uh, the attractor uh, and the Lord of Karmas are, are souls that help uh, put together um, the personalities. The Lord of Karma defines the incarnation, the time, and the place of birth. No, no, wait, let, let me take that back. The attractor puts together the personality. The Lord of Karma defines the incarnation, where you end up, the time, and the place of birth. And the, atta the attractors determine the appropriate characteristics contained in the pers personalities chosen to complete the program. So you have the two forces. Uh, note, this takes place under the jurisdiction of a specific divine force based on geography and population. So that's why we have different characteristics based on where we live. This can be a positive influence if the divine force is under control or very negative influence if it's not in control because the divine force will choose to feed off the vital energy and not exist, assist the evolution of the soul. Um, I am not sure if this is still as dangerous today. Um, so you might, if you're not a Muslim, you might not want to die in a Muslim world or incarnate in a Muslim world because you might be influenced by the rules. I don't know if today this is still applicable because of the triad being uh, harmonized and the divine forces being harmonized. So I'm making that statement because that's a question I'm going to ask. So why we have different features is because of where we incarnate and where we incarnate there's different forces. I want to add that this to those that were in Damanhur with me and had the selfic treatments. Uh, the, my understanding is the synchronic lines also have micro lines throughout the planet and each area of the planet has different micro lines. So that also helps to define uh, the different ways we look. And those micro lines are co all connected to the synchronic lines as well. So um, there is this wonderful connectivity and co cohesiveness with everything in, uh, that is going on. It's not by chance. There are very specific reasons somebody from the Orient looks the way they do, somebody from, you know, um, Japan looks like they do, and so forth and so forth. Uh, so building this, so, so let me just make sure I've got that. Okay, so building the soul is a complex process. Now add free will. <laughs> free will is we can choose, <laughs> right? And we can create a lot of problems. Uh, free will being the power to choose the direction of one's existence. This is a strong influence that can override the conditions that exist. So the, we, we, it, it's really one of the things that comes with the soul. We have free will. And we also, I didn't mention it, we also become bridge forms with the divine. When we have a soul, we become these bridge forms. Uh, so important objective of the soul is to integrate its various personalities. What we need to, uh, what we react to outside of us, ourselves is a reflection of the discord with those aspects of ourselves. In order for us to love and accept others, we need to love this in ourselves. And it could be a clue as to what part of our own personalities we have not integrated. That's why living in community is so valuable because you get triggered all the time. Illness can arise, and this Lena talks to what you said, illness can arise from poor integration between personalities. Schizophrenia, personalities not recognizing each other and create uh, strifes instead of bonds. 
megalomania, one personality takes a dominant role. If personalities don't get to express themselves through rotation, they find different solutions. And then you have liver, like things like liver pathologies, uh, you know, or we have heart pathologies. So we can look at, and this concept has been talked about that it's because we're out of balance. And now we've, we have another element that there's one of these personalities we're meant to integrate in that part of the body that we haven't integrated that, um, that is causing this cry out for attention. So the rotation of personalities um, can be uh, circadian rhythms, alternating day and night, night dark, repetition that is uh, sometimes uh, these repetition are easy to recognize. Uh, some rotations are faster, some are slower, uh, some are every 20 minutes and some a few times in a lifetime. So it doesn't mean that all these, let's say we have 70 personalities, we might only see that once or twice. So it also helps us when we are able, when we act completely out of character to help us understand what that could be about for us. So we don't judge that too harshly. So how to integrate the personalities, Duncan? <laughs> how to integrate all these personalities? All you need is love. Love. All you need is love. <laughs> love is all you need. So love is the only element that can bind the personalities to each other and overcome conflict. Each personality must transmit love to the other to integrate itself. Love can, can contain all our different aspects the capacity seen in love is an element of our divine spark. We can say that an individual's capacity to love gives us some measure of his or her level of contact with their divine component. Once we integrate all our various personalities, we immediately attain great power, enlightenment. Consciousness expands, we can break barriers of time and see the moments when our personalities were formed past lives. We will have higher level of energy, all personalities pushing in the same direction and metamorphosis is possible. And this is another element higher than enlightenment. Enlightenment uh, can also can be reversed because it stays in the personality and formation. Uh, and so if the next time you have an experience, you are not able to maintain that enlightenment, you can lose it. But metamorphosis, metamorphosis um, cannot be reversed. Um, and it may, uh, and the way, uh, so enlightenment can be reversed. Uh, it may fluctuate, but it is maintained. Um, but if it is maintained for a sufficient amount of time, the individual can access an even higher level of soul evolution, metamorphosis. Uh, personalities, what metamorphosis means that you are living in the real. The enlightenment still leaves you in the threshold. You can, leave, you can visit the real, but you're still in the threshold. Metamorphosis means you have now merged with the real and you are in the real. So the archangels, they reached a certain level of evolution. They were enlightened, but they didn't reach the metamorphosis. So they didn't go into the real. They stayed in the threshold. So just to give you an idea. So personalities merge with the attractors and become, so in metamorphosis, the personalities merge with the attractor and they become one. Um, they reach a, high level of consciousness, consciousness that is equal to the absolute intelligence of the attractor. So you are really becoming the real. So that's the goal, metamorphosis. <laughs> so a soul that reaches this is no longer bound by form, can determine his own incarnation, exit, uh, exists without the body, gains immortality, uh, it no longer needs a body. If it decides to have a body, it can be in multiple ones 
without births and deaths. Uh, it reaches personal goals, completes its program, and reawakens its inner divinity. So this reawakened soul can assist humanity as an avatar, a lord of karma, spiritual master, or other forms we might not be aware of. So the summary of the fundamental steps in the human soul's evolution. Guys, can I just take care of this little kitty cat? Or oh, she's not going to let me digest that and I'll come right back, okay? The cat rules, always. <laughs> always. Bust it. Yes, bust it. That's the cat. Elizabeth, you have a cat. Yes, we do, and she's sitting right by, close to us. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. her name? Her name is Jane. Jane. <laughs> well, she used to have a brother called Finch. <laughs> Jane and Finch. <laughs> 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 so I just adopted two orphans. Their person died by assisted death. Oh, no. Yes, yes, and, and one is a gorgeous gray tuxedo cat, very male. And the other is very female. Millie. Millie. Such fun. Yeah. It's such yeah. fun. And they tell you what needs to be done. <laughs> I, I, I need to migrate them to organic kibble. Oh. You know, and the water has to be structured water, filtered, you know, maybe energized properly, some homeopathics. Right. <laughs> yep. The litter must be changed every day. Every you change the litter every day? It's a, it's a garbage bag. You know, I put the litter there in the, in the bin, and then the next day it's out into the recycle, the green bin. Okay. No, because our cat, every time we change it, she decides that that's, she does, her business is done somewhere else. <laughs> so she doesn't like change <laughs> like a podium we're going to give her like a podium <laughs> hey, oh, okay <laughs> that is that spoken. For those that don't like change <laughs> like a podium download to Jane yeah. <laughs> right now hard time with transitions <laughs> yes. well that's planet earth <laughs> okay so I, I, I want to, I'm going to finish and then we'll have a nice discussion if we can, or I'll leave you to digest it. And then maybe next time we, we have a discussion. Um, so the summary of the fundal, fundamental steps in the human soul evolution, integration of personalities, enlightenment, stabilization of the enlightenment uh, or metamorphosis from this point on, there's no going back and then we reawaken the inner divinity and that's what we're here to do since it's unlikely we will achieve this in our lifetime but it's not impossible we need to discuss what happens at death and reincarnation do we want to continue i mean there's not much more but another 50 oh, minutes please please go on okay. <laughs> you guys okay Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we, what happens at death? Okay, so the part that uh, composes us detach. Okay, um, so the part that composes us detaches. The physical body stays in matter and what we're made of, the soul, uh, leaves. Um, the attractors go back to the real, leaving the personality in the threshold. So we are left in the threshold. The personalities disperse in the threshold and wait to be called forth again. Personalities that have reached a level of evolution can remain on the attractor and travel to the real, but then return, return to the threshold. Reincarnation, we can be made up of, okay, our, our reincarnation, we are made up of personality information, that these personalities that have a continuous history with us and are made up of those personalities we have integrated in the past. 
and the ones we haven't integrated, we lose. And then we have new personalities that offer us new possibilities that are added to our core personalities that we have integrated. This is the line, uh, and this is in line with complexity. The structure of the soul is to um, assimilate increasing number of personalities. Remember when the very evolved um, souls uh, before Atlantis were meeting other species, they would trade souls. So this is how they evolved by having these experiences among themselves. So um, it's good to challenge ourselves with different personalities. I wanted just to say. So remember, enlightenment is reversible. Metamorphosis is not reversible. In metamorphosis, we exit the cycle of incarnation and reincarnation. We can move forward and backwards and sideways. And now the punchline, <laughs> but I wanna read it to you because it's in page 122. So we have to do all this work with this 80 people or 70 people. And then what's the punchline? It's actually not that important. <laughs> Cause that's not what it's about, but it's fundamental to get us to understand something. <laughs> so, you know, it's the cosmic joke, you know, the, like, like whoever designed this game was really like, we're gonna have fun. I'm like, oh my God, okay. So, so now I just wanna read this because I think it's really well done. So, one last but certainly not this least important thought regarding the soul in a final analysis personalities are like the skin of our soul rather than the deeper part which is instead represented by our divine spark and our individual program or goal while we can host hundreds of different personalities from life to life, which have also passed through other individuals before us and will pass through others after us, our soul's mission is an element that remains constant throughout our many lives. From this, we can deduct that our individuality should not be sought in the characteristics of our personalities, but within our divine component, which is, which as we shall see, is a reflection of one of the 163 base element that compose the primeval divinity. If we restrict our attention to our personalities, we will live a life that is essentially pointless and that does not provide any result that can withstand the barrier of death. Ironically, the, the final result of focusing on the personality is therefore the loss of our identity. <laughs> Why didn't they teach us that in grade one? Yes. Don't waste your time with those personalities and those stories. <laughs> So listen, I want to tell you something because this is important. So we are part of the human primordial divinity in this shard of the mirror. This shard of the mirror, this primordial human divinity is made up of 163 elements. Okay. We are, each one of us is one of these 163 elements at our core. That's what we have to uncover. And once we uncover that, we have a much easier opportunity to align to our mission, what we need to do, and be able to integrate our personalities and get to this metamorphosis. Dun, da, da, da. And I want to tell you that um, Falco went through a period where he painted 163 paintings each with um, the elements. And I thought, you know, I can be a little bit bold sometimes. Give me the list, let me see what element. And I didn't understand anything. So I think that, that these are 
um, so you, it's like they're poetry, you know, they're, they're element, there's 163 paintings, each representing an element. Each one of us is one of these elements at its core. And unless you are ready, uh, definitely for me, the ones I read meant absolutely nothing. Um, so, you know, the idea of just taking a book and reading the 163 element, oh, I'm going to find out mine, forget it, forget it. I think it's such a, I think it's an inner journey, but I want to share something with you off the record. So I'm going to go off the record now. Um, Paul's recording. Um, no, I don't have to go off the record because I can cut it when we edit it. No, I should go off the record. No, no, it's okay because this stuff, no, it's okay. So, sorry, <laughs> the doubt, you know, the, the random <laughs> left in the battle. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, no, th this information needs to come out. So, uh, I asked Coyote when I saw him, I go, how do we learn, you know, which one is our element? Because I definitely couldn't figure it out from reading the descriptions of the paintings. There are techniques, there are courses. Uh, he, uh, a, a lot of the mystery school courses, a lot of the inner senses courses, a lot of the courses that are offered in Daminer is to bring you closer, you know, past lives, to bring you closer to understanding deeper things about yourself. Uh, but he created a course with his Italian group because he speaks mostly Italian, he, Italian. his English is not that great, um, on a techniques to um, help one arrive at their element. And I'm gonna be speaking with him tomorrow and I'm gonna see during this craziness of, uh, you know, pandemic, if uh, we can do it online. So I don't, and I don't, like, I don't know how much preparation we need. Uh, I know all of you have done different things in your spiritual, so you're not green. So I'm gonna have a chat with him tomorrow and my hope, you know, there's many courses offered at Dam and Her. We had, I had this discussion with some of you here. Um, I know the ones I want, and this one I want. <laughs> so it's not important. But I have never st studied with Coyote. I've just uh, asked, uh, you know, worked with him on the book. Um, I don't know what he's like as a teacher, so I can't vouch for that, you know. Um, but I'm very interested in getting techniques that can help uh, me and I think others uh, get closer uh, to identifying. Because can you imagine if your divine spark says you're a teacher and all of a sudden all the stuff you do in your life just gets aligned. It's like, of course, I've always been doing that, but I, it wasn't clear. And all of a sudden it's just so much easier for you to follow that path. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, a judge, or I, I mean, I don't know what the elements are, I have no idea. Like I said, I, the few I read, I couldn't understand. I was like, you can't just read a list and figure out your element. I think it's a process uh, to arrive at it. So I wanted to leave you with that because that's, that's where we're at. So now I can leave it up for questions or do you guys want to digest this and maybe we start the next, you want to write down some thoughts or you guys want to say something? This was long, yeah? This was long. I want to open it up to you guys. It's nine o'clock. I'm pretty cooked. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed that. It was very entertaining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you like the punchline? Oh, <laughs> oh, it. Grand drama and the timing is great. Always <laughs> with this crowd, timing is great. Okay, beautiful. So maybe I can invite you because this was a big topic. Uh, whether tonight or tomorrow, uh, anything that comes up, even in your dreams, and maybe we do a sharing the next time we get together. Uh, this is a big topic. It shakes a lot of foundations. It adds a lot of elements we might not have thought of. Uh, it puts some things in order, so we have a clearer understanding, but it's also a lot of information. So um, yeah, if you want, we can, I offer, I invite you, to take some time, make, you know, write them some thoughts or some, even just feelings that you may have that you want to share. And we can open next time with this and uh, let it work us and any dreams you might want to share. So I'm going to, we're going to finish it with that. This was a lot. 
this was a big piece, but okay, Elizabeth Duncan, you're good. So, mm -hmm. oh no, Elizabeth and Duncan and Cindy, can you stay on so that we can? Yeah, so I'll stop the recording. Okay.